Greetings from New York City and Columbia Business School Executive Education. I'm Scott Gardner, and I'm here today with Professor Shiva Rajgopal for the Learning from the Past, Corporate Governance Before and After the Financial Crisis webinar. Before I introduce Shiva, I'd like to go over a few quick logistics. If you look at your screen, a recording will be made available to you after the webinar. If you'd like to tweet about the webinar, please do so at hashtag CBSExecEd. And finally, most importantly, please submit those questions to the Q&A box throughout the webinar, and we'll get to as many of those as possible in the last 10 minutes. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here today with Professor Shiva Rajkapal. He is the Vice Dean for Research, as well as holding the Kester and Burns Professorship at Columbia Business School. He is a world-renowned expert on financial reporting issues, earnings quality, fraud, executive compensation, corporate culture, and corporate governance. He is passionate about bridging academic theory with policy setting and corporate practice and has a wide ranging experience in solving applied business problems. He also advises think tanks, advisory firms, and professional and trade associations. Shiva, it's great to be with you today. Same here, my pleasure. I'm happy to be with you. Now there's a lot of great material that we're gonna be looking at, so let's start off with the first question I have for you, all mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Now you, I know you've been looking a lot deeply at bank boards since the financial crisis. Let me ask you, do you expect these bank boards to change? It's not obvious, it's not obvious. The banks are special animals in the sense that uh, the usual modes of governance don't necessarily apply or don't necessarily work as well with banks. So, you know, who would keep an eye on the company? It's usually the shareholders. Mm -hmm. But bank shareholders are not necessarily accountable to taxpayers. That's where most of the financing for a bank comes from. Right. So a bank is typically financed out of deposits, which you and I say go and uh, leave in our neighborhood bank. Right. When was the last time we saw a bank run? We don't see a bank run because we have deposit insurance. Right. Because the federal government makes sure that if something goes wrong, deposits of at least about $250,000 are actually covered by the Federal Reserve. Okay. So as a result, depositors have no real incentive to keep an eye on banks. So banks end up taking more risks than they perhaps should. Mm -hmm. And it's, that's optimal for shareholders because it's a heads you win, tails I lose kind of situation. Right. If the risk pans out, then the excess is captured by the shareholders. If the risk doesn't pan out, at least if you're a big bank, then the hope is that you know the federal government will swoop in, knight in shining armor, to bail you out, and then right. you're okay. Right. And then there are other issues. You know, Things like the takeover market don't work very well. It's very hard for an activist investor to jump in, take control of the bank, because again, the regulators get worried about, say, takeover of banks from, say, uh, you know, foreign investors or foreign governments. So the takeover channel doesn't work as well as it perhaps would if this were some other company, like say Procter and Gamble or some other right. some other some other entity. Yeah. So it's it's not clear. It's not clear mm -hmm. that the other channels of governance work as well. It's not clear that bank boards should change because if you were a cynic, you would argue they did exactly the right thing, mm -hmm. right? So by and large, they made money for uh, their shareholders. They took a lot of risk, but by and large, they were protected from that risk, at right. least for the, for the big five or 10 systemically important banks. So with all those so, safety nets, maybe they don't see a need to change. Yeah, I mean, it's not obvious. Change is hard anyway. Right. Change, well, that's, that's what makes this setting interesting because uh, this is a fairly big shock, and a fairly big crisis. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to go and look at the data. If we find that things haven't changed a lot, even after such a big shock, then it's time to ask some serious questions. Right. So that's exactly what we tried to do in this study. Okay, great. All right, well, so you know, you and I have known you for a few years, have sat in classroom with you. I know that you've broken down it into four distinct remediation points, remediation buckets. So can we go through those one by one? Oh, absolutely. Great. And this is a dense slide, so we'll try and go through this slowly and carefully. Right. So if you're an academic trying to look for change, where do you start? So we thought the four big areas that we should worry about mm -hmm. are groupthink, lack of banking experience among directors, uh, lack of a time commitment. So if you're on the board, are you really engaged? Do you have the time to pay attention to what happens? And of course, critically, the risk management function. Okay. So what is groupthink? You know, most of us have been in meetings where the loudest and the most opinionated people 
tend to sway the conversation in a direction that the others may or may not agree with. And the others are scared of incurring the social cost of jumping in and trying to change the conversation. So they by and large just grudgingly go with the so-called consensus decision. Mm. The consensus decision is rarely consensus. Right. It's, it's usually driven yeah. by two or three loud people. Yeah. And uh, a lot of that seemed to have happened in bank boards before the crisis. So, you know, somebody thought, look, this is a money-making machine. Let's, you know, uh, double up on CDOs, which are these uh, collateralized debt obligations. Everybody said, okay, maybe, you know, who am I to object? Sounds fine. I get my bonuses and we're okay. So, so that's what we're trying to address, I guess, after the crisis. But the one big limitation as an academic is that I don't get to go into board meetings and boards don't keep minutes. And even if they kept minutes, I'm not sure they're reliable for obvious reasons. Right. So, yeah. so, uh, so the data is hard to So the data is hard to find. Right. So the best we could do was to go and look at some external measures of say things like board turnover, mm -hmm. meaning have new directors come in mm -hmm. since the crisis. Do we have a larger proportion of directors who are uh, you know, intellectually different, more diverse? Right. Now, measuring intellectual diversity is so hard. Right. So we often look for things that are easier to measure. Do you have, for instance, more females on the board? Do you have uh, you know, fewer affiliated directors, meaning directors who are otherwise uh, connected with the CEO or someone else on the board? Do you see people who are more uh, perhaps racially diverse? Do you see uh, you know, fewer... Caucasian members on US boards. Uh, and you could also measure things like CEO power, meaning the rules require companies to tell us how much the top five people in the company get paid. Mm -hmm. So you could measure the proportion of the CEO's pay to total pay. Okay. And mm -hmm. if the thinking is that, you know, if, if the CEO gets 30% of the total pay relative to, say, some other bank where a CEO gets 10%, so the claim would be that the first bank CEO is, say, much more powerful. So it's just a proxy for how much power the CEO perhaps the balance, holds. The balance. The, the, yeah, the it. balance. Okay. So balance yep. of power. Yep. Exactly. That makes sense. So that's what we look at. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we look at data before and after the crisis mm -hmm. for all the U.S. banks that we can find data for. And as the slide suggests, uh, look for yellows because yellows suggest what changed. Turns out nothing changed, mm -hmm. at least on these five proxies for groupthink. Okay. Which is uh, which is a bit disturbing. Yeah. So now let's talk about idea number two: lack of banking experience. So it turns out that many of the large U.S. banks actually had, say, you know, presidents of museums on the board, and it's not super obvious what those people probably, you know, were they able to contribute. Right. Because banking is a highly technical business; it's incredibly difficult to. Just explain what a derivative is, right. or an OTC swap is, or a CDO is, or a CDO squared is. Right. So, so the hope was that after the crisis, you would see board members who have perhaps a bit, you know, bit more relevant experience, a bit more industry experience. So the th the three things we look for here is, you know, do, do new directors have more prior banking experience? Right. Do they have more specialty finance experience? So for instance, if they've been involved in you know, M&A or uh, corporate finance or treasury or something along those mm -hmm. lines. And we could go and look at you know, how did the companies where uh, these people were board members or directors before they came to the bank, how did those companies do? Okay. So that's what I mean by track record right. in terms of say operating performance and stock performance. Yeah. And uh, if we look at these three metrics, at least there is some good news. Now we see more directors with more prior banking experience. Right. So some of these uh, museum presidents, I'm guessing, have retired or rotated off the board mm -hmm. to be replaced by people who have more relevant experience. But if you look at these other two metrics that we discussed, you know, prior specialty finance experience or uh, the track record of the, um, the directors or the chairman who've served elsewhere, that doesn't seem to have changed a whole lot. Okay. Now let's talk Makes about sense. time commitment. You know, being on a board is uh, very time consuming. So, but obviously I can't, I don't, I don't, I don't get to see the, uh, the calendars of the directors who are on board. So I can't measure that. Right. So we look for, again, somewhat indirect proxies. So we go and measure the number of outside boards that a non-executive director sits on. 
And the thinking is that if you're sitting on six boards, chances are your attention's all scattered and it's pretty hard to focus on what goes on with one company. So mm -hmm. that's the intuition. Uh, you can also look at the number of committee memberships the board uh, member sits on. Right. Now boards have all kinds of committees as you know. The audit committee, the compensation committee, the risk committee, the uh, ESG committee, which is environmental, social, governance uh, responsibilities. So the more memberships uh, you have, perhaps the less time you can spend right. uh, on a specific task. So those are the two things we go measure. And it turns out that if you look at outside directorships, that really hasn't changed since the crisis. People are still sitting on as many boards as they were before than after. Okay. But it turns out that the number of committee memberships they have has actually gone up. And that's, that kind of sounds counterintuitive, but it's happened because of the fourth point. You know, every bank now has a risk committee. So the number of committees have gone up. And the risk committee is an important committee, so you want the key directors to be sitting on the risk committee. So the number of committee memberships have gone up. So that's a bit of a mixed signal, so I don't know what to make of that. Mm -hmm. So again, the evidence so is- generally not, more oversight um, on these boards. Well, at least the, the good news is with risk management. That's right. our fourth point. Right. So now most boards, virtually all the bank boards that we looked at, do have an independent risk and reputation committee, which is great which kind of loops back into our previous point. Mm -hmm. That's why the number of uh, committee memberships seems to have gone up. Every bank board now has a dedicated CRO, which is a chief risk officer, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. We also looked at the CRO's status in the company, and how do you measure that? Do they show up in the list of the top five most heavily compensated employees? Mm. And it turns out, as you can see, that's not highlighted. So if you look at the CRO status, it's not obvious that CROs show up more frequently in the top five after the crisis relative to before. Mm. But the good news here is that every bank now has a risk and a reputation committee. Every bank has a dedicated chief risk officer. Uh, so if you look at the gestalt, the overall picture, we've effectively looked at 21 measures uh, in this uh, chart here. And of these 21 measures, there's you know, clear improvement on maybe four measures. And one of the measures is a bit mixed. So, uh, you know, you can consume the evidence as you, uh, as you will. This is the evidence. But to me, it, it's pretty modest. So, positive-ish? Positive-ish. Okay. No, that's a good okay, one. Good. So, let's, <laughs> can, we, can we go to the next? Oh, I sure. So, yeah, you know, absolutely. Basically, what does this all mean? What does it let's mean? talk about what this means. Well, it's, it's interesting. So what does one make of the fact that five out of 21 um, measures have improved? I would say it's, it's modest mm -hmm. because this was, a, this was a colossal shock. You know, this almost brought down Western civilization, I would say. Right. Right. So, and frankly, a lot of the blame rests squarely with the banks, sadly. So I was expecting to see more before looking at the data. So I was a bit... Uh, you know, I was kind of encouraged, but a, but a, but a bit disappointed. Okay. And then if you probe deeper, you can also look at things like compensation, right? So how are these senior managers being paid these days in banks? And here, you know, comparing the US to Europe is kind of interesting and informative, because if you, if you compare the pay structure of the CEOs of the top five officers in Europe versus the US, it's kind of fascinating and mm -hmm. predictable. You know, you, you, the, the U.S. CEOs of banks are in general paid more on short-term measures, more on um, financial measures, mm -hmm. like, like accounting and stock performance, mm -hmm. compared to Europe, where they are in general paid on longer-term measures, mm -hmm. and they tend to be non-financial. Okay. So things like bank culture is explicitly written into compensation plans of, of, of many European um, banks. Mm -hmm. Not so much in the U.S. Oh, right. And this is the other issue. One of the big, uh, hard to measure, intangible, but a very important uh, force in all this is corporate culture. And what is culture? When people are not looking over your shoulders, what do you do, mm -hmm. right? And it's so easy, it's so easy to, uh, in a bank, to have a culture problem, right? Mm -hmm. For example, when you walk in and you, uh, you, you try to get a loan, say for a house or from, for a car, they make you sign a 30-page document. Right. Do you ever read what is in there? No, so it's so easy to slip something in there, right? right? So, uh, so that's where culture comes in. When people are not looking, what do you do? Right. So has culture changed? Are, are, uh, you know, is, are we now 
making sure that we don't necessarily take advantage of our customers because in the short run, you can easily make money off them. You can make bonuses. And four, five, ten years later, bad things happen. We, we know many examples. Wells Fargo is the latest, for right. instance. So has culture changed? That's, again, difficult for me to tell, right. you know, from the outside. So, um, you know, so, so, so that's one, you know, an important element to keep an eye on going forward. Okay, good. You know, uh, and, of course, the million-dollar question. Will all this prevent the next crisis? I hope we don't have one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I, it, well, I hope people learn from the past and yeah. institute new policies that will right. prevent that. That's the hope. I mean, is it commensurate to you know other crashes that we've seen or other? I mean, like what the response rate was, the percentage of positivity is that? At least so that's a, that's that? a, that's a very good question. So 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 the last time we had such a big crisis was probably the nineteen twenty nine recession. Right. Yeah. And that was followed by a lot of regulation. Right. Right. And. But whether regulation helped or not is frankly still being debated after so many after years, all these after years. hundreds of years. Yeah. So it's never obvious. Yeah. But I would say on balance, regulation did help after the crisis. In fact, after the previous recession, we had something like deposit insurance. Right. You know, you don't see the classic "it's a wonderful life" moment right. where right. Uh, right. people are grabbing, yeah, running to the bank and trying to right. <laughs> trying to try, right. trying to sadly withdraw and get out of the bank. Right. But that creates its own problems, unintended consequences. Now okay. that you have deposit insurance, you know, it gives banks a little bit of a license to take more risk than they should right. because the depositors don't keep an eye on them. Okay. You know, sort of a double-edged sword. Double -edged All sword. right. So we have, uh, let's move on to the next, talk about these, some of these buckets in more detail. So you, based on your study, you talk about succession planning and some best practices for that. So, you know, what are we looking at here? Succession planning. So it's always hard to be in a room uh, in a meeting, say, run by the CEO and try to ask the CEO the following question. You know, do you have a succession plan? Because they get really threatened. Right. Oh, my God, if you have a succession plan, chances are I'm going to be fired. Right. You know, and then, you know, in fact... Is there a coup? Is there a coup? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you can see that in politics, absolutely. Yeah, I, I can imagine. So the key is to kind of destroy yeah. the bench, at right. least in politics, right. right? So it's the board's responsibility to make sure that at least insist on a plan. Having a plan is half the battle, right. right? And if you look at disclosures in companies, barely a fourth of these companies tell us about their succession plans. Oh. So a few best practices to kind of review them very quickly. Insist on a plan if you're a board. Regularly look at the plan. And make sure that the CEO is told in no uncertain terms that this is good for the company, this is good for the CEO. Right. If the CEO's plane crashes, God forbid, then what happens? So if there's a crisis, a succession plan is invaluable, right. you know. So, but of course, of course, it's, it's a matter of creating trust between the CEO and the board, and that's not always that easy. Right. So, these things are likely to work well if you have a trusted incumbent CEO and a lead director, right. whose job it is to go, you know, create and manage the succession plan. Right. Well, and if there's transparency to the CEO about why you're doing this, right. then they're not going to think it's a coup. I mean, just they're be, less be likely transparent. To. Yeah. You know? Well, think... successful leaders are insecure, too. Well, that's true. <laughs> that's the problem. All right. So let's move on to the next. Mm -hmm. So groupthink. This oh, is yeah. a problem. What are some best practices for this? We've too? already talked about the, the, the dangers of groupthink. Uh, and one of the practices that I find to be pretty effective is, you know, when there's a contentious issue, mm -hmm. role-playing works well. Okay. So I'm going to make you an advocate for a proposal, and I'm going to become the critic. So once I play a role, it kind of depersonalizes the situation a little bit. It becomes less emotional, and we have a more honest intellectual debate about the pros and the cons of a problem. Right. Otherwise, we get vested in one position, and we sometimes get blindsided to the other problems associated with that proposal. Mm -hmm. So role-playing helps brilliantly. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I often advocate is you know, listen to people who disagree with you. Right. So short sellers. So mm -hmm. who are short sellers? People who bet against your stock. Right. They actually put their money where their mouth is. Right. You know, so, they, so they have bad news about your company, at least they think they do, and they're selling the, short before actually, they're selling the stock with, uh, and they don't own it. And the right. hope is that when the price falls, they buy it back and they make money. Right. So one out-of-the-box idea would be get short sellers into your boardroom. Talk to them. Right. Why do you feel bad about our stock? Right. What are we missing? What are we missing? You know, so that it's it's hard, it's, it's hard to do, but I think it's it's extremely informative. It's, a, it's imperative. Yeah. I mean, it's it's imperative. Must, yeah. But right. how many times do we usually get people who disagree with us right. into our homes, right? 
Yeah. So it's, it's kind of behaviorally hard. Confidence of a leader. Yeah. You know, is playing a lot of parts. In Absolutely. This. I mean, that seems to be. All right. So the last part is time commitment. How many hours can someone expect to dedicate to a board? And, you know, what are some best practices for that also? Lots of hours. It turns out it's roughly about 250 hours a year. So a 40-hour work week, I'm guessing we're looking at something like six to seven weeks. So yeah. I would say... Five hours a week yeah, for 52 yeah, weeks. I mean, that's just, that's you know, quite a bit. And as you yeah. know, it's not sadly uniform, right? So you'll have these peaks and valleys. Well, exactly. exactly. Right. If so, you were able to parse it out, life would be but easy. then people are also on six boards. That's the so. problem. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. so, so the best practice, I would say, would be more than three would be probably too many. Yeah. And uh, the time commitment is even higher if you're sitting on more uh, you know, committees and if you also happen to be the chairperson of the board. Uh, so what are some best practices? Obviously, don't overcommit. That goes without saying. And here's something else that I think is, uh, is, is useful advice. People usually jump on the opportunity to be on a board. But I would say you want to interview the board as hard as they would interview you. So the, the, you know, the, the best asset that you have is reputation. If you lose that, then you're nowhere. So you, know, you need to do as much due diligence about the company as they would about, uh, you know, about, about your background. Right. And uh, don't overcommit. Right. Well, a lot of good information. We've got questions coming ah, in. Cool. It's an important topic to people, so uh -huh. can we answer a few uh, of those? Absolutely. absolutely. Wonderful. Let's do that. All right, so Gene uh, wrote to us, and he said, you mentioned that you're making money, profits to traditional shareholders' book value. But book, book value uh, seems to no longer connect to many market shareholders' value. This is an old linear view, but we live in a nonlinear world now. How are banks currently adapting their governance to fit in the world that we live in? So it's a, it's a great question. Yeah. So at the risk of being a bit technical, so let's think about this notion of uh, market to book. So what's the notion of market to book? So the idea is you take what the market values you at and you compare that to the so-called accounting value. So the market to book uh, of a company in general is ideally more than one, which would say the firm has future prospects. But if you look at European banks, it turns out that the market to book ratio is actually less than one. Deutsche Bank has been less than one for like three, four years now. Mm -hmm. And how, how does one read that? One way to read that is that the market thinks that the bank is destroying value. The future is actually worse than what your current assets on your books tell you, mm. right? The other interpretation of that metric would be the market is telling you that your assets are worth less, so you should take an asset write down. So the, you know, the, the book falls in market to book, and then market to book becomes closer to one or more than one. Mm -hmm. So what is the takeaway in terms of this metric? If market to book for a bank is less than one, or for any company is less than one for a long period of time, mm -hmm. the directors need to be really concerned and worried. Mm -hmm. Why does the market feel that, you know, in general, the accounting assets of a company understate the company's true value. So if the market thinks that the accounting numbers actually overstate its value, we have a problem. Uh -huh. So it's actually a fairly serious signal to worry about if you're a director of a company whose market to book ratio is less than one. Oh, wow. All right. So Ralph has asked, mm -hmm. uh, this is, I think this is a good question. It goes back to the choosing of a board. Mm -hmm. What types of red flags should we look for when interviewing for a prospective board seat? Uh, and I would also add my part of that, like what are some things you sh you know, that are not red flags, you should be, uh, qualities that you feel well, we should be looking for? You know, the first thing I would say is pull out the 10K. The, uh, you know, for, the, for overseas viewers, 10K is the, uh, the annual report for a company. Uh, try to understand how the company or the bank makes money. Okay. What are the critical value drivers? What are the critical cost drivers? Understand the company reasonably well. And then probe directors about those pain points. The second thing, you know, it's not all about numbers, obviously. Trust is crucial. Right. You know, do you have a good feeling about these people? Like anybody, yeah, like, hire. like yeah. anybody would hire <laughs> exactly. you. But your name's going to be on the on the, on the proxy statement, right. you know. Right. So it's 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 different from I mean, you know, you know, it's, it's still it's still hard. For instance, if you're an Arthur Anderson employee right. after Enron right. to go find a job, right. you know, it's not your fault. Yet that name is on your resume. That name is on your resume. Yeah. So you lose reputational capital. So understanding these people 
And if, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you don't have a good feeling about working with these people, just walk away. So my, my guess, why would somebody hire someone who is the head of a museum? Is, is the assumption that this person is a financial expert? I mean, or is it just assumption of, why is that, why was that happening? I don't... Well, you know, I mean, how many of us like to be challenged? And nothing against people yeah, who are not, head of museums. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm, yeah, just, yeah. I'm just saying, like, what Absolutely. is that relevant to the board job that they're well, taking? I mean, I'm in a classroom, you know, pretty much half the year, right. sometimes with you. Right. How many of my students actually want to take exams? How many of them want to take quizzes? Nobody likes to be evaluated. Nobody likes to be challenged. So it's just much more comfortable to surround yourself with friends and family. Right. And, yeah. you know, people who look as though they, are, they, they have some reputation, Yet, people who will probably not give you a hard time in the boardroom, right. when it comes to the nitty gritty, you know, why are you acquiring this company? Or why are we investing in this plant? Or, you know, why are you getting paid this much? Who wants those questions? So my hypothesis would be, it's just easier and more comfortable to be with people who are less likely to disagree with you. Right, so. right, but one of your, you know, one of your bits of advice was you have to have those people that challenge you. I know. I mean, you must it's, have it's easier said than done. Of it's course. easier said than done, but it yeah. is important. It's important. To think about and we that. do that, I think, probably better in academia than in industry. Right. You know, yeah, so. <laughs> exactly. All right, Dan has asked, in your study, did you look at the changes to the second and third line of defense functions, not just the existence of a CRO? There's been significant change here and with regulatory oversight. That's a fair point. A lot of that information is not publicly available. So people would often say things like, you know, risk management processes have become better, um, you know, there are just more, I mean, a whole bunch of things have changed. Dodd-Frank, for instance, mm -hmm. was, was intended to fix some of these problems. Now, Dodd-Frank has run into a whole bunch of implementation issues. But the short answer to uh, Ralph's question is that it's somewhat hard to know as an outsider. And it is somewhat hard to trust insiders because they'll always tell you things are better. So, you know, perhaps the best entity that's, uh, that can answer your question, Ralph, is maybe the Federal Reserve because they get to see data that we don't get to see. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm hoping and praying that what you're saying is right, for everybody's sake, yeah. so, hopefully, so that we don't have another crisis. Right, all right, so uh, Adisa has written, California passed a law mandating a female director on the board. Passed a law mandating that. Right. Do you think this is the way to go? It's a fascinating question, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, so if you're, if you're the libertarian bent of mind, uh, you know, I could argue maybe a knee-jerk response would be quotas are bad. We, don't, we shouldn't have quotas. And, you know, that, that creates all kinds of distortions. But I often remind these people about, say, smoking. When smoking was banned, people complained. And then a generation later, you know, people don't smoke voluntarily. Right. So sometimes when you're in a bad equilibrium and in a bad spot, you know, some intervention may not be a bad idea. Yeah. And to, to give you some data to support that statement, if you look at the rate at which females are um, displacing males, as, at least on the boards of medium and small companies, it will probably take anywhere between 25 to 50 years if we don't intervene. Right. You know, the, the, the replacement rate is glacial, extremely slow. It's a little better with the large companies because they have much more pressure from institutional investors. Right, right. But if you just leave the medium and the small companies to their own devices, it's going to take forever. Okay. So maybe the, the Californian law, despite its short-term costs, and there will be some short-term costs, hopefully would, uh, will just push us to a slightly faster trajectory. Accelerate. Ac accelerate. So, yeah, yeah, it's going to accelerate. So, yeah. You know, on balance, I think it's not such a bad idea. Someone who wants this for their life doesn't have 20 to 50 years yeah, to so wait around for that. Okay, That's true. Yeah. So if you're female, and if you want to be on a board, move to California. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully other states will, other states if it's a good product, you know, pick That's it up. true, other states will. If there's a success there, do you think other states will pick that up? Do you, do you think that's possible? A lot of this becomes political, sadly. Yeah. As you're, uh, but I'm hoping, in, but I, you know, maybe New York will be next. Who knows? I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, All right. Well, you know, we've got about 45 seconds left. So, you know, what would you say is, you know, a couple key takeaways for the people that are watching here today. A lot of people like a good key takeaway at the end. So what do you, what do you think? Ah, and you know, these are, you know, at the risk of probably overstating this. These are life lessons. Mm -hmm. You don't want to overcommit. That's the time commitment right. point. You want to do whatever you can to surround yourself with diverse thinkers. Celebrate dissent, however hard that might be because dissent is a very valuable piece of information right. about how you're doing. Right. And uh, what was the last, third thing I forgot? 
There you go. Hopefully, these are two good takeaways. Yeah, those are good. <laughs> those are good. No, but those are good. But it all goes back to that leadership confidence right. in making these decisions that are good and sound. Right. In my mind, you know, when I'm hearing you talk, it really is going to depend. It is a it is a person issue, not just a finance issue. It is a person Absolutely. issue. Absolutely, right? like most things. Like most you know, things. Like, yeah, 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 numbers are just a way to understand human interaction and drama in, right. in, in institutions. Yeah, numbers. Right. Our data, but di you have to tell a story with it, right? Well, totally. <laughs> I mean, there's an underlying that. human process yes, that generates exactly. those numbers. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Thank you so much for being with us today. A lot of great information. I hope people found this very useful. And again, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Thanks again for tuning in.